San Juan has no shortage of plazas in its historic district, such as Plaza de Almas in front of City Hall. This plaza features two statues of a lamb supporting a flag, which is an image taken from the city's coat of arms, the original version of the coat of arms given by the King of Spain. The totem pole was designed by a Puerto Rican artist and is made from clays from across the Americas. La Valleja is a statue consisting of three figures masterfully intertwined in structure. At Plaza San Juan Batista, you will find the coats of arms for the major municipalities of Puerto Rico and, of course, its statue of St. John the Baptist, all across the street from the Capitol building. The plaza also has a stairs that leads to a small beach. Pelicans are a common sight near the Capitol and throughout Old San Juan. Under Spanish rule, San Juan was filled with merchants trading goods from the New World. They built homes to reflect their new wealth. The city is well known for its colorful Spanish colonial architecture and you can easily spend a day photo shooting the streetscapes. Spain had vast territories in its viceroyalty of New Spain in the Americas. Puerto Rico was the closest major island to Europe in Spain's possession. All the European powers wanted it. Spain would invest heavily in fortifying San Juan's strategic location with its ideal port. We will be exploring the two forts that Spain built. Castillo del Moro and Castillo de la Perla, which is more commonly known as San Cristobal. Upon entering the main courtyard of San Cristobal, you cannot help but notice the three flags that fly above. The flags of America and Puerto Rico are well known, but the third flag is the Burgundy Cross flies above this fort as a reminder of this island's long history under Spanish rule. The four large barracks located off the main plaza were constructed in 1771 and consist of two floors. Looking inside the vaulted rooms of the fort, one imagines what it would have been like to live and try to sleep as a soldier stationed here. One way to get to the upper level is by using a circular staircase on the south side of the fort. This takes you to the highest part of San Cristobal and was known as the Cavalier of San Miguel. We were surprised to find so few tourists in the fort. It was convenient for getting good pictures without needing to wait. The San Juan sun is hot and the constant wind from the Atlantic provides a little help, but make sure to bring your water bottle and your sunscreen. The Cavalier served as an observation deck and gave excellent views in all directions. Peering over the 18 to sometimes 25 feet thick walls, you get a good view of the Capitol building and Isla Verde to the east. Greater San Juan is in the distance, and the cruise ship and ferry terminals are located in the Bay of San Juan to the south. The courtyard below is massive, and one must imagine what it would look like filled with soldiers performing their drills. Looking at all this surface area, you also have to wonder, where would all the rain go? Well, they collected underneath the fort in cisterns, 
Springs. The entire fort has evidence of its design to transport water from higher levels down to the next until it's finally collected. This is a good use of runoff water since there is no nearby river. Looking west from the Cavalier, you get a sweeping view of the community La Perla and of the lighthouse at San Felipe del Moro in the distance. Artillery tracks sit next to this not too architecturally pleasing World War II lookout tower. However, once inside, its efficient slot window design makes it easy to see how a soldier could view the eastern coastline, the vast expanse of the Atlantic Ocean in the middle, and the coastline to the west, all through one unobstructed window. The Spanish Garitas, century boxes that punctuate the walls of Old San Juan, while charming to view from the outside, don't provide that functional level of visibility from within. When traveling from level to level, you will frequently find tunnels with ramps. This made it much easier to move artillery carts from one level to another. Well, maybe not much easier. It was still done by human labor. Beasts of burden were not permitted in the fort. Why, you may wonder? Well, remember how they collected their drinking water? The mortar balls, placed here in pyramid form for display, were excavated from the grounds around San Cristobal. These balls are hollow to allow them to be filled with explosive powder so that they could explode over the enemy or on impact. From here we continue on to our next fortress, San Felipe del Moro. Upon entering El Moro, we see a similar, though smaller, courtyard. And again, we see representations of what living quarters might have looked like for Spanish soldiers. We also see more artillery tracks where we can imagine cannons being swung around to fire on enemy ships. El Moro Fort has seen its share of action. In 1595, Sir Francis Drake failed in his attempt to attack El Moro. The gunners of El Moro thwarted Drake with their cannons and the use of a metal chain stretching across the entrance to the bay. This Moorish-inspired lighthouse was built in 1908 and replaced an earlier lighthouse which developed structural problems. Although seeing a few more tourists than we found at San Cristobal, there were no crowds. We were frequently the only people in the section, and getting good, unobstructed shots was easy. In 1598, the Duke of Cumberland overtook El Moro by land and occupied the fort for six months. Illness and dysentery forced the Duke to give up the El Moro, and the fort returned to Spanish control. However, this prompted Spain to build San Cristobal to defend the city from the east. When it was first constructed in 1539, El Moro was just a tower. The expansive fortress that we see today was modified several times, but it largely reflects the design of Spanish military fortifications of the latter 16th century. Later attacks from the Dutch and the British proved largely unsuccessful because of the extensive fortifications of San Juan. The fort is constructed with six major levels, and it is impressive to go down a few and be able to look up at the massive walls of the levels above you, then turn around and look over the wall to the levels still below you. Outside the walls is a path that extends around the fort on two sides, and we will travel that path next. 
The Paseo del Moro Trail follows masonry defensive walls that once surrounded the entire city of Old San Juan. The construction of these walls began in 1630 and were completed around 1678. While walking along the trail, evidence of the maintenance performed on the walls of the city by the Park Service is apparent. The Paseo del Moro once served as the maintenance road for the west section of the city walls, but in 2001 it was designated as a National Recreational Trail. Placards like this one explain the importance of the wall and its gate back in the day when the gate served as the main entrance to the city. Next to the gate you can see the blue and white crenellated mansion, home of the governors of Puerto Rico. While walking along the bottom of these massive stone walls you can enjoy views across the bay and breezes from the Atlantic Ocean. All of this helps to provide a historical experience unlike any other. In the distance, you can see the famous Bacardi Rum Distillery. The trail skirts the city wall from San Juan Gate to the fort of San Felipe del Moro along the entrance to the San Juan Bay. Future plans include an entrance to the Paseo del Moro from El Moro Fort itself and a continuous trail to connect up to the Fort of San Cristobal. The better views are as you approach the fort. Once you get to the fort, you are actually too close to it to get a good look at it. Looking out to the ocean and to the bay, you see the line of boulders that have been deposited to help protect this corner of the island from the pounding Atlantic surf. Continuing on to the end of the paved trail, you once again get better views of the fort itself. A narrow dirt path allows you to go part way towards San Cristobal. The path, through dense vegetation, offers clearings with pretty views. While walking along the path, you will hear rustling in the snake plants beside you. It's probably the brethren of this little guy. Continuing along, we are soon provided with this lovely vista. When we get to the next clearing, we have a great view of the cemetery of Santa Maria Magdalena with La Perla and San Cristobal in the distance. This cemetery, more commonly known as the San Juan Cemetery, sits next to El Moro and overlooks the Atlantic Ocean. It is noted for its intricate tombstones and the circular neoclassical chapel dedicated to Mary Magdalene. The cemetery is also the final resting place for several famous Puerto Ricans. From San Juan, we took a shuttle to Fajardo and from there set sail on a catamaran cruise to Cayo Icacas, one of many small islands off the coast of Puerto Rico. My brain was fried from learning all that history in old San Juan, and I was ready for a nice, relaxing sail. There's nothing like dangling your legs off the front of the boat and watching the water beneath you as you see the small island in the distance. This pleasant day at the island consisted of getting off the boat to do a little beach walk and shell finding, then a little snorkeling in the shallow waters. Before I knew it, the day was over 
and we were racing the other boats back to the main island. I can't help but wonder why I don't have more photos and videos of the day. It might have been because the very attentive crew was sure to offer me a new drink each time I set down my run punch cup. Don't let my lack of footage make you think this excursion isn't worthy of your time. A day trip to one of these small islands can be very enjoyable. Next, we rented a car and headed to Cueva del Indio near Arisema. You will pass this statue commemorating Christopher Columbus's discovery of Puerto Rico and the New World as you approach the Cueva del Indio coming from San Juan. Once you arrive, you will find a parking lot with an attendant. The walk to the cliffs is not far from the parking lot, though not clearly marked either. The Cueva del Indio is said to contain the largest number of Teano petroglyphs found along the coastal zone. A ladder leading down to the main cave was removed in 2017 to make it more difficult for vandals to further mar the site. It is an unimproved site. There are no handrails, no sidewalks. To get to the overlooks, you need to walk across lava rock, which is sharp and uneven. Wear sturdy shoes that provide good traction. When looking up at it, the terrain looks much more even than it is in reality. So when you are walking, watch your step and not the view. Once you look down at the terrain from above, you can see just how uneven and pitted the surface is. Definitely not for those with poor balance and not wheelchair accessible. At times, the rocks form steps for you to use, though mostly uneven. And at times, there is quite a jump to make to your next step. But enjoy traversing all around the cliffs to see the views and watch the beautiful Atlantic waves crash on the rocks below. There is a plethora of cliffs, arches, caves, and bridge formations to explore and view. So find a spot to stand or sit and just take in the seascape for a few. Next, we headed to a little corner of the island called Rincon. Fittingly so, as Rincon means corner. I'm staying for my first time at a resort with a pool bar. You can even get lunch there. It's open both day and night. Did I mention it has a pool bar? We actually stayed at two boutique resorts in Rincon. Rincon of the Sea Grand Caribbean Hotel and Rincon Beach Resort. Each had pool bars and beautiful beachfront. I enjoyed taking a walk by myself each morning on the beach. Frequently, I was the only person on the beach for as far as I could see. In Rincon, there are many options to dine or get a drink and watch the sun set across the waters. The plaza in Rincon in El Pueblo 
the downtown area, is an active place. Even visiting on a rainy Thursday, we enjoyed this open-air market with artists selling their crafts, live music, and specialty food and drink. Rincon is known for winter surfing and for year-round activities like snorkeling, scuba diving, and parasailing. We took a little drive to Crash Boat Beach to see the psychedelic side of Rincon. We even got to watch an impromptu paddleboard race. cannot help but notice how close many of the businesses are to the edge of the water. While staying here, I saw some interesting sights on the beach from my hotel balcony. I also got a bit of a surprise while relaxing on my lounge chair on the beach too. B&B to the left of my hotel had suffered considerable damage and repairs were underway. On the other side, the villas had received such extensive damage they were being torn down completely. I spoke with one of the men operating this heavy equipment and asked him how busy he has been since Hurricane Maria. He indicated that he was plenty busy with improvement projects before the hurricanes hit, and that since then, he and his men have been working non-stop. I really loved the solitude I got each morning on my beach walks. I was a little sad to leave Rincon. From here, we traveled inland to see the Tanama River. We had an experience that included a bit of hiking, tubing, and then alternating between wading and swimming in the river. As we hiked through the forest, our guide BJ would point out beautiful and potentially dangerous flora and fauna, such as fire ants, that we would want to avoid. There are two underground river caves on this journey. The first cave, is called El Portillo, the Little Doorway. Sometimes this cave can be unpassable due to heavy rains, high waters, and debris, and such was the case at the time of our visit. So we only saw a small bit of that cave. Even with the heavy rains, our first section of the river remained calm, which allowed us to enjoy some leisure tubing and jumping off the large rocks into the deep water. After our calm start, it was time to put away the tubes and continue down the river in a combination of wading and swimming until we reached the next cave. With the water being so muddy from the many rains, you could not see just how quickly the water got deep. Many times, the surface water appeared near calm, but the water below was rapid and pulled you along. I was glad to have BJ as our experienced guide to warn us, and show us what to do. We also saw plants that I've only seen in nurseries, and here they grow wild like this lantana clinging to the banks. It was beautiful to see all these tiny, natural water features. A 
As we continued along, the river grew in speed and in width. The size and the height of the waterfalls feeding it grew as well. All were breathtakingly beautiful. The second cave on our excursion, La Cueva del Arco, is huge. We were able to go inside and see the formations. BJ also showed us what could be done with the stones lying on the ground. Some of them could be used to make black and white face paints, as would have been done by the Taino Indians 500 years ago. To finish our tour, we climbed one of the waterfalls and used the rushing water to clean out the debris that had built up in our shoes. As we started hiking through the forest to the bat cave, it began to rain. No matter, we were soaking wet anyway. In the bat cave, we would look down on the river below us and also get a chance to see more humongous stalactite and stalagmite formations. You could also hear the bats above you, but no robins. The Tanama River excursion was so beautiful, I couldn't believe we had the entire valley to ourselves. Thanks again, BJ. Next, we drove for an afternoon stroll through the cobblestone streets of San Germán. San Germán has a rich history with 250 Spanish colonial buildings. It is the second oldest town in Puerto Rico and one of the best towns to admire Puerto Rico's architectural heritage. It was named after the second wife of Ferdinand of Spain, Romain de Foix. San Germán was once the capital of the western side of the island. Under Spanish rule, the island was divided into two administrative districts, one administered out of San Juan and the other administered from San Germán. We started by heading to the tourism office and were immediately able to get booked on a tour of the larger of San Germán's two historic Catholic churches, Iglesia San Germán des Auxerre. This church is the newer of the two and still functions as a church. Here we learned about the Catholic allegory of the pelican and its young. We enjoyed seeing gripping religious artwork. But I have to say, my favorite was the magnificent ceiling. The interior is one of the most lavishly decorated on the island, with trompe l'oeil painting that imitates wood coffers. The other church is the Porticelli, one of the oldest churches in the Americas and the oldest church in the United States. In 1609, the Dominican Order built the Convento de Porticelli at the crest of a hill in what is now San Germán's historic district. 
Today the church houses an art collection which includes wood statues of saints, paintings, scriptures, and other religious images. Our next adventure would take place at the southwesternmost edge of the island in Cabo Rojo. After enjoying views of flocks of shorebirds feeding along the saltwater lagoons and marshes, it is time to begin our one quarter mile ascent to the Faro Los Marios de Cabo Rojo, or the Marios Light. From the eastern side of the lighthouse, you can enjoy a sweeping view of the pink-hued saltwater marshes, the turquoise bay, and the beautiful deep blue of the Caribbean Sea. To the west of the lighthouse is the Puente de Piedra, or Stone Bridge, which seems to defy gravity and provides a natural link to a small rocky pediment. Precipices just to the south of the lighthouse hover over 200 feet from the ocean below and provide mostly solid, though uneven footing, and gusting overlooks. Looking down from above, you can see offshore monoliths and lower rock line coasts dashed by waves. Visiting in the shoulder season between the winter months when most mainland visitors come to the island and the summer, when most Puerto Ricans vacation, you can enjoy the park almost to yourself, except for this guy who kept tagging along beside me. Coming down from the cliffs near the lighthouse to the bay, we are standing on the first of two forks of the peninsula. The bay between these forks allows you to get a closer and calmer look at the water and its inhabitants. For a solitary, up close, and spray filled experience with the Caribbean surf, take the one quarter mile walk skirting the bay to the end of the non lighthouse fork of the peninsula. Our final destination was La Paguera. This seaside fishing village has managed to retain its casual, low-key ambiance. This is the place that Puerto Ricans go to get away from it all. La Paguera is not heavily promoted in travel media, so it remains a hidden gem. By day, the main attractions here are La Pared, the wall, offering about 20 miles of excellent scuba diving, deep sea fishing, and the many small offshore islands. We took a cruise around the small islands. We enjoyed seeing the other boats. And the small houses built on many of these tiny islands. La Paguera was fortunate and was largely missed by Hurricane Maria. Good thing for all the people here today. At night, you can head out to the water to see the bioluminescent bay, either with a large group by boat or in smaller groups by kayak. The bioluminescent dinoflagellates light up when the water is disturbed. It is an unbelievable sight to see the sparks of these tiny microscopic creatures in the water. Sadly, capturing the magic is not easy. It doesn't show up using typical cameras. We stayed at the Parador Via Paguera.
we had a terrific waterfront view off our room's patio. To be part of the Paradors de Puerto Rico program, the accommodation must meet certain standards set by the Puerto Rico Tourism Company. These include being located outside the San Juan metro area, having 15 to 75 rooms, an on-site restaurant, and being family owned and operated. During the week, you felt you had the entire place to yourself. What you will notice on the weekend is the nightlife. The atmosphere is fun. Families and couples are out and about, and the people are literally dancing in the street. You can even get group dance lessons in the street. you don't want to dance, find a bar or a restaurant with a balcony and enjoy the action from above. I hope you have enjoyed taking this little adventure in Puerto Rico with me. Adios! What's over the top is anybody's guess. <laughs>